Science fiction writers often live solitary, private lives, but those lives can be stranger than their fiction. What you may think you know about the genre and its authors may be wrong, and you may have missed some fascinating facts completely. In the video today, we're looking at 10 of those. Number 10. William Gibson doesn't care about technology. Anyone familiar with cyberpunk would recognize the name William Gibson. He invented the genre with his 1984 novel Neuromancer, which paved the way for movies like The Matrix. In fact, the Wachowskis borrowed the term Matrix from him. One would think that a literary pioneer would be attracted to technological advancements and be an early adopter of new gadgets. But while Gibson is intrigued by the way technology shapes humanity and society, the technology itself doesn't interest him. He said that even as a boy, he was never into the idea of robots. Back in 2000. In 2010, he was still sending out faxes. Despite the fact that many sci-fi fans consider him the literary godfather of cyberspace, he's never been interested in computers as technological objects. He's claimed that his favorite technology is the latest word processing software, and he was always very slow to adopt to email and the internet. Number 9. Michael Crichton's first love was medicine. Everyone knows Michael Crichton as the author of science-driven novels like Jurassic Park and Congo, which were turned into blockbuster movies. But most forget that he was behind the creation of ER, one of the top medical dramas of all time. In fact, he had been shopping the idea of a medical drama to TV stations since the 1970s. After directing Westworld, he wrote a documentary-style movie about how things really go down in an emergency room. Since the idea of realism in TV dramas was ahead of its time, he had to shelve the concept until the 1990s, when he and Spielberg came together to produce ER. When Crichton was in medical school, he wrote a different type of work featuring medicine. Novels such as Drug of Choice and Zero Cool focused on doctors and scientists put into spectacular mystery situations. Although firmly based on scientific principles, they featured a pulp sensibility lacking in his later works. Publishers have re-released these James Bond-type works following his passing. Number 8. Frank Herbert Disliked Homosexuality the relationship between Dune author Frank Herbert and his son Bruce was a difficult one growing up. It became even more difficult when Bruce started living in a drug house and began dating men in the 1970s. If you've read the Dune series, you have a sense of Frank Herbert's view of homosexuality. In the first novel, Baron Harkonnen is a loathsome character with sadistic tastes. In Emperor of Dune and Heretics of Dune, he negatively describes homosexual forces at work in fictional armies. To him, such behavior was unseemly and immature. Despite the tension that existed for years between Frank and Bruce, they reconciled enough that Bruce and his then-boyfriend showed up at the Dune film premiere in 1984, a little over a year before Frank Herbert's death in 1986. Number 7. Philip K. Dick was pro-life Philip K. Dick never liked abortion. In 1961, his then-wife Annie terminated her pregnancy because she had just had their daughter, Laura. Although he begged her not to go through with the procedure, she believed that she couldn't raise two small children at the same time, especially with Dick's constant money troubles. His anger at the situation shows in his then-unpublished novel, The Man Whose Teeth Were All Exactly Alike, where he modeled the couple on his own family. He was also furious when he heard the result of Rowan Wade. To vent his feelings, he wrote the short story The Pre Persons. In it, the government doesn't consider a person a legal entity until the age of 12. In order for the country to consider someone a person, they must learn certain tasks like algebra. It ends in a twist when the father, who was considering giving his son to the abortion truck, offers himself up as he has forgotten algebra, even though he was once a math teacher. Dick received a lot of hate mail, but said that his beliefs on the matter were firm. In fact, he donated money to a pro-life group, despite the fact that he lived in poverty until his death. Number 6. Marion Zimmer Bradley was complicit in child abuse Bradley's most famous work, The Mists of Avalon, was particularly popular among feminists who loved that she took on the legends of King Arthur from a female character's perspective. A hip miniseries was even later made based on her work. But when she died in 1999, revelations revolving around her relationship with ex-husband Walter Breen burst forth. In the sci-fi community, it was common knowledge that Breen was a child molester. The law had charged him twice with the second conviction, sending him to prison. However, what wasn't known is that Bradley had been the subject of a civil lawsuit. It was believed that she had helped him procure young girls or turned a blind eye to his abuse, which also occurred against Bradley's daughter, Moira Grayland. Then another bombshell dropped in 2014. Graylin said that not only had her mother been complicit in the abuse, but that she had participated as well, abusing her from the age of three to the age of 12. 
She described her mother as violent and cruel. This probably shouldn't have surprised Bradley's associates, as in her 1998 disposition on the Breen case, she stated that she believed young teens should be able to have sex with adults. Number 5. Ray Bradbury became a staunch conservative. When Ray Bradbury wrote Fahrenheit 451, he was concerned about government censorship. Looking at the examples of Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, he was worried about a totalitarian spirit surfacing in the United States. However, another theme is political correctness and mass media swallowing up the pleasures of critical reading. In the novel, the public abandons reading because it's too difficult and because different groups view certain books as too offensive. By the time of his death, Bradbury argued that this was the principal theme of the novel. His political beliefs changed over the years, particularly during the tumultuous 1960s. His parents raised him as a staunch Democrat, but after becoming disgusted with the foreign policy of Lyndon Johnson, he voted Republican in 1968. Although he registered as an independent, he voted for the Republicans in every election with the exception of Carter in 1976. Shortly before his death, he began supporting the Tea Party movement, saying, There is too much government today. Number 4. Dr. Jerry Pornell is buddies with Newt Gingrich. If you've followed Newt Gingrich's political career, you'd recognize that space exploration has a special place in his heart. During the 2012 Republican primaries, he talked about a moon base. In his second term in the House of Representatives, he proposed the NASA Policy Act of 1981, which offered a pathway for statehood for a potential American moon colony. Later, he proposed taking away farm subsidies and using those taxes to invest in space travel. Gingrich claimed that the works of Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke showed him the possibilities of space exploration. However, he received direct advice from a modern titan of science fiction. Since the 1980s, Jerry Pornell has served as an advisor on Gingrich's scientific proposals. When Gingrich published his first book, Window of Opportunity, A Blueprint for the Future, he consulted Pornell about the possibility of climate manipulation from the moon as well as space tourism. Pornell is the first name in the list of acknowledgments. Gingrich even hired Pornell's son as a congressional staffer. Number 3. Robert A. Heinlein hated bigotry. If you came across reviews of Heinlein's work, you'd assume that Heinlein was a racist, misogynist authoritarian, something that Starship Troopers lords fascism. But Heinlein had strong black, Latino, Asian, and female protagonists before it was politically correct. So how did his personal actions reflect his views? Well, in 1964, Heinlein supported the candidacy of Barry Goldwater. Heinlein had met and befriended the senator when Goldwater was visiting Colorado for a hunting trip. Heinlein was impressed that Goldwater had taken the initiative to start hiring African Americans Americans at his business, even though it might upset customers. He also appreciated Goldwater's efforts to desegregate Sky Harbor Airport. When an associate suggested that African Americans willing to campaign for Goldwater should form their own committees, Heinlein told the associate that he should treat them equally. Heinlein's political views are complicated, but his progressive views on race they were always clear. Number 2. A bunch of writers formed a space advisory council. In 1980, many astrophysicists believed that the incoming Reagan administration would take space policy more seriously than the last. So, a group of military personnel, entrepreneurs, scientists, and sci-fi writers formed the Citizens Advisory Council on National Space Policy, largely under the leadership of Dr. Jerry Pornell and his frequent co-writer Larry Niven. Soon, technically proficient science fiction authors packed the meetings. The group helped formulate policy that defined the 1980s. The Citizens Advisory Council provided much of the material that resulted in Reagan's famous speech that endorsed the proposed Strategic Defense Initiative satellite system. Although the government failed to complete the SDI, the threat of it brought the Soviets to the negotiating table. Number 1. Orson Scott Card Loves Video Games Even if you're not a regular sci-fi reader, you've likely heard of Card's Ender's Game. The story revolves around Ender Wigan, a young boy who Earth recruits for an ongoing war against aliens. He believes he's training in a simulation, but in reality he's sending real troops into the line of fire. It shouldn't be surprising that Card has an interest in video games. In an interview, he mentions that he had to stop playing Civilization II because it was encroaching on his family life and the time he spent writing. He estimates that there are 20 novels that were never written because of his addiction, and he has compared himself to a recovering alcoholic. Card's interest in gaming goes back to the early 1980s. When Card took the position of book editor at Compute, he reviewed games and wrote a column on programming. He followed the progression of the game industry and made contacts with other professionals. George Lucas noticed the success of Ender's Game and invited Card to work with Lucasfilm Games. Card served as a dialogue consultant on The Secret of Monkey Island and The Dig. 
In recent years, he collaborated with a publisher to produce Advent Rising as he wanted to bridge the gap between literary storytelling and video game plots. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also, if you're looking for something else to watch right now, check out one of our other videos linked to on the screen now. And as always, thank you for watching.